Okay, welcome back. Thank you so much. Um, this is part two of our interview with uh, Tafiri Brent, and uh, we are going to continue this conversation talking a little bit more about not only the vice presidential debates, but we are also going to be talking about um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, thank you. You know, just to to kind of like chime in on, you know, just just some of these these things, you know, we can't really um, we can't really predict some of the behaviors of other people. Sure. And, you know, I'm not, you know, here to discuss any of that. I really want to be able to, you know, really empower people, individuals to be able to feel that they have some power to change sure. things, you know, on a little level, sure. because those are big, giant things to, to really have to dissect and to unpack. And, you know, we don't have all the answers for, you know, being able to, to, to predict what people are going to say and what kind of actions they're going to have. I just know that, you know, with the level of involvement that I have over the past, you know, few years, you know, since getting involved in local politics, you know, after graduate school and leaning into my own community, I, you know, haven't seen a lot of these particular things. Um, but, you know, everybody's experiences, you know, they're, they're, you have to take it case by case. Um, and, you know, not to say that, you know, these things are not happening. Sure, sure. But how do we, you know, empower folks to, to stand up and push back? How do we empower people to, to work a little closer, to examine things? And I know that currently our city is about to undergo uh, cultural sensitivity training that starts tomorrow. Um, and, and I realized that that's, that's the beginning. That is important. And, you know, my mission is to really kind of get from you, like, you know, okay, well, how do we make sure that, you know, people know what to do to, you know, to really be able to, to, to change, to, to make things, you know, happen in a meaningful way and to not kind of dwell on, you know, things that happened in the past and to move forward and, you know, to be able to, to have that sense of, you know, I have a voice and, you know, I am going to push for something that, you know, really unites us going forward. Yeah, well, I think that a lot of that work is being done. I think that we need to always approach things from what we call a Sankofa, a Sankofa perspective, which means return to the source. In other words, what that speaks to us to never forget what has happened to us, so, sort of like our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, one of their mantras is never again, right? Never, ever again. And they use that as energy and as a spirit uh, to galvanize uh, their particular uh, demographic and their particular group of people to ensure that they implement controls and implement systemic and legislative change to make sure that never happens to them again. I think we need to uh, uh, express and demonstrate that same level of commitment to change. And I think that you're doing a lot of that work, right? So when we talk about police reform, some of the things that we've done and some of the conversations that we had and you've had them as well with your uh with your uh with your director of public safety uh of Vince Smith who I think has a good heart and has a willingness and a desire uh to do the right thing as well as your city manager who currently is not there but he's uh currently he's in the military uh, serving his country uh brother Riker I feel as though that they have the right kind of spirit and the right kind of mindset to bring about positive change, like in regards to police reform. Let's look at, you know, um, eight can't wait and ensuring that the city comes in compliance with the eight can't wait police reform, uh, police reform measures that has been established throughout this country. Uh, and uh, when you look at the researchers who are law enforcement experts and 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 um, uh, and law enforcement individuals and also scholars who have uh, through the data identified the fact that when those police reform measures have been implemented, it's, it reduced uh, use of force crimes and the killings of unarmed folk, especially black folks, anywhere from 16 to 64%, depending, on, depending upon the municipality. I think the work that you've done with, um, with of course, uh, with of course uh, your business soup and your organizing uh, minority business groups and associations within the city of Harper Woods to ensure that African-Americans who represent over 60% of your population has access to the economic resources in that city. I think of course that's 
uh, definitely important. I think the work that uh, Brother McGee has done, the superintendent of Harper Woods Schools, who comes out of Central High School, he used to be the principal at Central High School. I think he has done great work. I think the work that Brother Will Smith as the coach of uh, some of the Harper Woods athletic programs and the work that he's done with his Neighborhoods Association uh, has uh, is reflective of the kind of social change that can have a, an impact. I think we have to also make sure that we register uh, uh, many of the citizens in Harper Woods, especially the African American community, so so that they can position themselves uh, for so that their voice can be heard and so that they can make significant contributions to the political and governmental structures within uh, Harper Woods. And of course, once we register them, we then have to educate them. Then, of course, once we educate them, we then have to galvanize them. Then after we galvanize them, we then have to mobilize them and get them to the polls. That's the way that we get our Ernestine minds. That's the way that we get a formal, uh, former council member, uh, Will Smith. That's the way that we get a state rep, Yancey, and an and a Adam Holier. That's the way that we get a Mayor Kimbo and, and others who are to follow. That's the way that you get diversity in your police department. I mean, Let's talk about it. I mean, your police department has one full-time African-American police officer, and that police officer also serves as, he does double duty, also serves as the only African-American fire person, right? Uh, I mean, so there's opportunity there, uh, but I think the opportunity can be taken advantage of when we uh, register, uh, galvanize, organize, educate, right, and mobilize all of the citizens in Harper Woods, not just the uh, not just the, the white minority that is there now. We have to make sure that everyone's voice is heard, that everyone is valued, that everyone is respected, that everyone is at the table, and that every everyone has um, uh, uh, everyone is considered a stakeholder. And when they become stakeholders, they then uh, they then uh, 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 they then uh, develop a sense of buy-in and they contribute to the kind of social change that you and I are talking about. So, so that's something that I do have to push back and say that, um, you know, like I said, any, any, uh, I think most leaders recognize that, you know, you just continue to go forward and that even perfection can be made better and you can always work towards making things better and their best. So, you know, this is something that, you know, living in this community, you know, all of my adult life, um, I have to say that we have come a long way and that, you know, in the past, you know, maybe five to 10 years that we have made tremendous strides to, to, to change just a lot of, you know, the image. And I think this image isn't just something that's unique to Harper Woods. And I think some of these, you know, problems as far as, you know, diversity, inclusion and, you know, re representation as far as, you know, demographics, it's something you also see in the Gross Points, you see in East Point, you see in, you know, communities that have begun to change as far as their demographics it's not unique to us um, I and I think we have done it and I think we've done it in ways that other communities are not necessarily you know up to the up to par with you know doing these things and you know I really have to go back to you know just talking to our neighbors and everybody feels a sense of positivity and you know for us to have this spotlight shine down on us you know over the recent months of the summer um, due to some tragic events I think that in some ways it has kind of writ large a, a symptom that we had been working tirelessly and had been doing well at getting that, that needle pushed. And it may have been slow and incremental, but it was definitely there. And you ask, you know, I talk to my neighbors and you, you, you have conversations with the community and you ask people around here. And, you know, I think that, you know, the, the consensus is going to be that we are getting there and we are working towards it. And, you know, the surprising thing is, you know, these conversations about, you know, how how we can move the needle forward have been coming from, you know, unlikely places and they've been coming from folks that, you know, you, you wouldn't think would be, you know, having this conversation and, you know, people have been stepping up and people have been willing to take a deep introspective look. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, we, we have a ways to go, but it doesn't mean that we are, you know, we're, we're not 100% there, but we we we're getting there 
And, you know, I have so much faith and pride in my community that, you know, I, I want to see the positive and I want to make sure that we keep things upbeat because we can be, you know, a multicultural community that, you know, is a Harper Woods for everybody. Yeah, but I, you I, know, think, not- I think it's key. <laughs> I think it's key. I think it's key, though, that um, uh, we can think positively, but we have to acknowledge the negative in order to make things positive. And I think the fact that I think mm-hmm. you would have, I think, I think you would admit this. I mean, I mean, you should have been mayor pro tem, right? Based upon my research, right? But however, but, you I, I, know, I, that's the thing about it. I feel like I personally, you know, I'm I'm willing to like move forward and move I, I, beyond but that. But, that, that. Was, but I'm mm-hmm. saying, but that speaks to the culture there. That speaks to the opportunity. That speaks to the negative that needs to be addressed. Brother Will Smith made it clear right, to political leadership in that city, to the police department, to Vince Smith specifically, and to the city manager, that there was an issue with the Harper Woods jail. And then shortly thereafter, he made that clear to them, Harper Woods uh, uh, public safety uh, leadership and city management did not respond to it. And as a result of that, possibly it contributed to our sister being found dead on that jail cell floor. Right, I'm saying so. Even with the, even with the attorneys, the attorney who tried to act, you you know, I understand. Get deep into this conversation because it is still open for litigation. All this is public information, though. Right, I'm saying all this is public information. This is nothing new. Has nothing to do with litigation. These are facts, and these are the kinds of things that need to be addressed if we're going to do what you said and make sure we move towards the positive. That's all I'm saying. I applaud the work that you're doing, Councilwoman Lyons, right? But what I don't appreciate is some of the disrespect and the mistreatment of uh, of a lot of the, uh, some of the political leadership and some of the grassroots leadership in Harper Woods who have been trying to make significant change over the last decade or so, but their voices have been ignored, devalued, and disrespected. Because here's the reality. Me and my organization and the Slater family and other organizations would not be in Harper Woods had not a Detroiter been found dead, right, on the Harper Woods jail cell floor. Had, what about this? Had, if, if a lot of brothers and sisters in the community had stepped up and spoke out against what was happening in that jail, maybe Priscilla Slater would still be living. And these are just the realities. I'm only there because there was a gap, because there was an opportunity. Right. That's the only reason why we, why we were even in the community in the first place, because there wasn't a proper and appropriate response from the folks who were there. But I applaud you. You showed up because you and I had a conversation. I told you when we were coming, did I, did I not? We had a conversation. Right, right, right. And you know what, to, to just kind of shift gears a little bit, I do have to say that, um, you know, we we will get there. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't press harder to make sure that, you know, not only our city government and leadership there, you know, other other council folks, you know, other, you know, appointed officials and government officials that we didn't all do our part. And I think this is something that I do have to think, uh, say that thank you for keeping us all, you know, accountable and, you know, on our toes. Um, but, you know, just for the sake of, you know, uh, you know, just shifting gears. Yes, um, I do want to, you know, kind of get into your thoughts on um, the evolution of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. We talk a lot about um, protest and fighting injustice and, you know, fighting it in the Metro Detroit area and beyond. So what are your thoughts on, you know, what has happened since, you know, the death of George Floyd up until, you know, a lot of the the protests um, that have been happening, you know, as far as Portland and here and all over the country and just this movement around um, what started, you know, five years ago, maybe six years at this point, um, you know, and then now uh, you you have a lot of people and it's a it's a movement that encompasses a lot of folks are running around saying Black Lives Matter, whether, you know, African-American or not, no matter what their ethnicity. What are your thoughts on, you know, how things have shifted as far as, you know, not only the statement, the movement and, you know, the actions behind it? I mean, when you when you really peel back the layers on Black Lives Matter, it's really inclusionary and um, integrationist language, right? So 
while many folks see it as being radical, <laughs> I mean, inherent within the language, it's, it's pretty moderate, right? It's really declaring that black lives matter and black lives are to be valued just as much as every other American citizen's life should be valued. I think what is wonderfully radical and progressive about the movement is that really for one of the first times in recent American history, you have law enforcement institutions being held accountable for not extending justice to unarmed, innocent, in many cases, African-American folks who have been murdered by the police. The difference between white brothers and sisters who've been murdered by the police and black folks who've been murdered by the police is that many black folks have not received justice, right? And we know that, for instance, in many African-American communities throughout the country, when there's urban violence, right? Black killers of black people, in most cases, get held accountable. And in, in over in, in the city of Detroit, According to Chief Craig's data, we're looking at a 60% clip, right? We recently, under the leadership of Sister Brenda Hill, we uh, initiated an old case unit where about 65 to 70% of those cases, cases were closed, where about uh, survivors, uh, children were murdered, children were murdered in the city of Detroit. So Black killers of Black people, in many cases, get held accountable. But when you start talking about uh, 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 white officers who kill unarmed black people, right? And you start talking about qualified immunity and you start talking about all these other built-in mechanisms that protects uh, police officers when they commit these kind of crimes against unarmed innocent uh, citizens, right? This is what the Black Lives Matter has done radically progressively and quite positively in this country. So I support the movement wholeheartedly. However, I'm a proponent of Black self-determination. I'm, I'm a proponent of Black political power. I believe that we need to go beyond just Black lives mattering and Black lives being empowered or possessing power to ensure that institutions and systems respect the fact that we matter and respect our humanity and respect us as citizens of this country and protect us under the constitutional values and laws expressed by the founders of this country, many of which, by the way, were slave owners, right? I'm saying, so uh, I think that we need to go from Black Lives Matter uh, to Black self-determination, to Black political power. And when you look at even the Black power movement, let's peel back the layers on the history. After the Black convention movement of the 1970s and the civil rights movement of the late 1960s and the Black power movement of the 1970s, you had over 35,000 Black elected officials. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going from mattering, right, to us having power and then using that power to affect and impact positive change, systemic institutional change within our, within our communities so that we enjoy all of the rights given to us by the Constitution. I'm talking about everyone being treated uh, as Americans per our Constitution and per the law to this land. So I support the Black Lives Matter move, the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay, I'm I'm just asking because in some ways, um, I I think that what's beginning to happen is like, especially in the case of like Portland, you don't have like a, a large African American population there, and you know what I was beginning to see was this movement that, um, to use the term. Um, you know, I, I feel like the, it, it was it was more being hijacked um, by by someone who you know groups who were just looking to to be kind of destructive and you know um, those those folks were not always you know African American faces that were you know doing these things and to you know trying to be heard and so you know I just kind of wonder um, you know is this going to be a movement that is usurped by voices that are, you know, kind of straying away from the original message and to, you know, kind of then project something that, you know, kind of distracts from the whole purpose of the movement and, you know, how, how different will that then be? And, you know, that's, that's just kind of, you know, my thought. Um, yeah, I, I think we can't allow the demographic makeup of demonstrators and protesters to overshadow uh, the principles uh, that the movement was built upon, right? So what happens is we get caught up on the, the visual. We get caught up on what we perceive to be a movement that on some levels may have or may not have been co-opted 
by uh, white folks who have a different agenda other than the Black Lives Matter movement. We get caught up into that, but we, we allow that and we should not. We have to be more sophisticated and more mature and wiser than that to allow that to usurp or undermine the principles on, upon which uh, the movement was established. And that's where I like to keep my focus. In every movement, you're gonna have provocateurs. In every movement, you're gonna have individuals who, you to co who try to co-opt it. You know, there's not an individual that I've ever met who's not opposed to fascism. So Antifa, you know, contrary to what this ignorant president puts out here, uh, Antifa is not a, it's not of a, an organization. It's a, it's a, it's a mindset, right? It's a mindset. It's a movement of ideals rooted in, uh, uh, rooted in the thought that tyranny and the suppression or oppression of in, any particular group of people, right, should be stood against and should be fought against. So there's no such thing as an Antifa organization. Anarchists, that's a different thing. And there are some uh, white folks, uh, white folks who are from the far, I don't even want to say far left, I don't know what their orientation is, but who have an interest only in destruction and overthrowing government, but yet they have no plan to replace that government that they overthrow, and they have no plan to address systemic discrimination, marginalization, oppression, suppression and, suppression and racism. I reject all of that stuff, but I would venture to say, and I would argue that the leadership of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is oftentimes reflected in the imagery of our beautiful and brilliant and, and vocal sister, uh, Tamika Mallory and some others who happen to be black faces. We know the founders, of course, were African-American women. I would venture to say that they are the leadership and that they are the face and those of us who are in positions of leadership and power have to make sure we don't allow the movement to be co-opted by other people's narratives who don't have the best interests of those upon which the movement was established in the first place. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So there's validity to what you're saying. And I have made some of those same arguments, you know, in certain places at certain times, but I'm very, very clear that the principles and the occurrences and the circumstances and the behaviors upon which this movement was established is sound and it's constitutional and it's godly and it's righteous. And it is that that we must stay focused on. Thank you, thank you. Um, to to kind of close us out, I want to you know ask you some questions about you know um, your your thoughts on you know the vice presidential debates last night and you know just some of the conversations around. Um, just, just community policing, and you know, just uh, uh, discussions around you know support for police as far as you know having more accountability from police unions, and you know having more um, of this, this, this. Uh, just just kind of sharing the low where we have social workers coming in, and we have you know a lot more uh, you know just just kind of uh, taking all of the onus of police to solve every problem, you know, um, and then also just kind of talking about this kind of dog whistle term of, you know, law and order that you're hearing out there, um, you know, especially during the debates. Um, what are you, what are some of your thoughts on these issues? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, the reality is that there are two different schools of thoughts uh, and, and two different models of behavior. Uh, in regards to law enforcement. You have the slave patrol model, right? Which tends to be reflected in a lot of what we see in American policing. Then you have the Sir Robert Peel, the Peelian model. I don't know if you, I know that you are very well traveled in these I, 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 languages. I and I know, mm -hmm. that's why I'm in your wheelhouse. So I know you know these things, right? So I think that we need to push American policing towards the Peelian model and not and, and away from the slave patrol model. I think that's key. Let's be clear, there are two different schools of thought. I think also we need to be mindful of the fact, it's quite interesting, I laugh at really anything uh, Trump supporters and, and Trump uh, staff members and Trump himself uh, uh, mention uh, or, or speak to in regards to so-called law and order. And you're right, it is a dog whistle term. But here's what's true. This is what we need to focus on and nobody, no one's talking about this. The reason why you have uh, upheaval in this country is because when uh, Trump 
assume the position of president. He and his appointed uh, attorney general, Jeff Sessions, remove consent decrees imposed by Barack Obama and Joe Biden on police departments who have been identified as habitually practicing racist behavior. This is a fact. They removed the consent decrees. You know why Detroit police went from being one of the worst, most murderous departments in the country in the early 90s? Between 1995 and 2004, they killed over, they killed over 40 unarmed citizens, okay? But when uh, community activists like Reverend Anthony and then you had good community police, police folk like Benny Napoleon under the leadership of Mayor Archer, uh, they had the DOJ impose consent decrees upon uh, the police department. And after 12 years of a consent decree, the uh, DPD uh, went from being a murderous, unrighteous, right, police department rank with police, police brutality and police misbehavior to being a department where about uh, 26 out of 100,000 folks were actually uh, murdered uh, by or killed uh, by the police department, which meant they were in the lower, they were in amongst the lower top 10 of police departments throughout the country in regards to police shootings. In fact, in the city of Detroit, you have more white, you have more police officers who have been, who have been killed or shot by citizens than you have police officers killing citizens. Now, this is nothing to celebrate, but what that speaks to is the impact of the consent decrees. It speaks to the impact of the training. It speaks to some degree of restraint. It speaks to the radical changes that have been made to the use of force policies, right? So consent decrees work. Trump removed those consent decrees from those from many departments throughout the country. And many of those departments were actively involved in the killing of unarmed black people that led to social upheaval, right? So that's just a fact. We had a remedy in place. We had corrective action in place. We know we were moving. When you look at uh, Barack Obama's 21st century police report, right? I'm sure you probably but read it. Something that to... our police chief has even like yeah. in the city of Harper Woods, you know, he kind of introduced some of this language. Yes, and, yes. You know, and we're working with him on that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And we've already, you know, we've assisted uh, DPD uh, to your question and going from four out of eight to eight out of eight. Uh, chief Barron from Southfield, uh, that beautiful brother who's the chief of Southfield, who comes up under Chief Greg, he was his, he was his assistant chief. Uh, they are now eight out of eight and, and ca eight can't wait. Chief Haddad at Dearborn, who also happens to have two social workers on staff, who also happens to have police officers working in the schools with, with, with community and with children and with families. He will be eight out of eight by the end of this week, right? We're also... Uh, working with, of course, uh, your city and, and, and Vince Smith. We're also looking to work with Benny Napoleon and Wayne County Sheriffs, right? And they've been receptive to it. And then ultimately we wanna sit down with the Michigan State Police. And then of course, Forndale has some issues we need to address as well. And uh, that chief, Chief Palazzolo has agreed uh, to bring his department into compliance as it pertains to use of force. These uh, police reform policies, save life and they expect exactly. you to save black life so i think and it, you know you you did hit on a point about um you know just some some of these these like you know this this contract these agreements these i think it's also important to 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 recognize de-escalation yes. training that's because you, you want to save police right. lives you want to save black lives so but that's the thing i think it also takes you know that understanding that de-escalation is you know the approach and I don't I don't want to minimize the fact that being a police officer is a dangerous job. I have family members sure who are police officers. I am close to a lot of our police officers in the city of Harper Woods. And, mm -hmm. you know, I recognize that this is not an easy job. And, you know, just being a public servant in that capacity, it is never easy to make those decisions. Um, and, you know, do you neutralize a threat or do you try to talk through it? And, you know, so those are things that I think, you know, more people need, you know, support in understanding how to even do it. And I think training is important. Uh, tra training, tra training, training is important. I think mental health services for officers 
is exactly. important because officers and, reg mm -hmm. officers regularly deal with traumatic experiences and many uh, officers, especially at the sergeant level, have expressed to me that they haven't been assessed in years, that they don't have any mental health support. So think about it. Police officers already have the highest level of divorce, the highest level of, of uh, domestic violence, the highest level of substance abuse of any professionals in the country, right? So they're already dealing with tremendous, uh, tremendous forms of uh, trauma and they're taking it, you know, even into their personal lives and destroying their personal lives. So if they can't keep their households together, right? How do you expect them to then treat our citizens respectfully and peacefully, right? So I think that while we need to definitely deal with the mental health challenges that many of our citizens are, are dealing with, uh, we also need to deal with the mental health challenges that many officers are dealing with. And let me be clear, let me be very clear here. I'm not opposed to police per se, as long as they follow the Pelian model of policing. However, I am adamantly and aggressively and undeniably and unconditionally opposed to bad police. Bad police must go, period. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and, you know, for that perspective, and I think that's that's kind of crucial for folks to understand. And, you know, this is why I'm personally committed to, you know, just having more conversations with, you know, policing. And, you know, I think in some ways people, you know, would say like, oh, well, you know, these, this, this person is going to be more violent, this, and no, no one person or one group is going to be more, you know, inherently violent. It is more a system. And if the system is broken, it is not serving our police, and it is not serving the people who are being policed. And so that is the real issue that, you know, I really would like for more people to understand, because there is no, you know, I'm on the side of blue lives, I'm on the side of black lives, it should be, they serve, you know, you know, the, 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 the law enforcement is here to serve everyone, is here to protect. And so um, that that is something that I just really want to drive that point home. And if I have to workshop this idea to, you know, to have something like this every month or at least a conversation and go talk to, you know, more police in not only my community, but other communities, um, if, if that's what it takes, I think that's really, you know, the crux of it and to make sure that that conversation is ongoing. <laughs> And Councilwoman, I, I would encourage you because we are we're already working. We we're, we're working with, of course, State Rep. Yancey, who is one of the leaders in regards to criminal justice justice reform and police reform, and we're working currently uh, with Senator Chain, uh, who has already co-written, uh, I think, eight bills relative to police reform, and uh, Senator Jeff uh, Irwin out of uh, Ann Arbor is doing great work. So I would encourage you if you haven't already done it and maybe you and some of your uh, co-workers to uh, connect with those legislators because it's key, it's key. You cannot change systems and institutions without changing policies and procedures. We cannot legislate personalities, right? We cannot legislate one's emotional disposition and one's psychological disposition, but we can darn sure legislate, govern and manage their behaviors and make sure consequences are rendered unto those who conduct themselves in a way that's not in the best interest of the communities that they've sworn to serve. Like one of the things we're talking about doing, just to make it real plain, uh, and, you, and you're probably well aware of this, but one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to get MCOs changed so that officers who commit crimes, officers who have been considered giglio impaired, officers who have violated uh, uh, the trust of the community and going against uh, those principles that they sw they've sworn they've sworn to uphold and adhere to, we're asking that MCO's policy be changed via legislation to uh, to decertify those officers, right? Mm -hmm. Not just put them in a database so that it, so that they can be identified when they're kicked off one department and then they go hide themselves in some other department and wreak havoc upon upon the civic citizens in those other cities, we're saying let's decertify them so that they can no longer be police officers in this state. 
Right. That's and where we need that, to go. you know, I've I've had conversations with, you know, Gross Point police and police in Ann Arbor, police in here, you know, and and I think this is something that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I brought up this point at a recent Michigan Municipal League convention talking about, mm -hmm. you know, the roles of police unions in making sure that, you know, bad apples don't just keep getting passed around, you know, to from police force to police force, you know, and kind of tainting the whole barrel. So, you know, uh, you know, I do have to say that um, this has been a very robust conversation and, you know, I am about to get ready to upload uh, not only our episode of the podcast, um, but, you know, this episode uh, via YouTube. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And do you have any, you know, closing remarks or words of wisdom um, for, for the audience out there and, you know, just, just hopes and wishes for the future? Yeah, I would encourage you to, to, to demand that your voice be heard and to engage the processes accessible to you to ensure that your voices are heard. You are stakeholders in your community and you do have power and you, you do have agency and your vote does matter. Don't allow anyone to trick you into believing that your vote does not matter. Your vote doesn't matter if you don't vote if you don't engage the process. So I wanna encourage everyone listening to me to take control of your lives, to take control of the circumstances and situations that you feel are putting you at a disadvantage, to stand up and go to your city council meetings, go to your state rep meetings, go to the mayor's meetings, go to Lansing, know who your senators are, know who your state reps are, know who your county commissioners are and demand of them because after all, you voted for them, and if you didn't vote for them, you darn sure paid for them via your tax dollars. Make sure this they, they serve the best interests of you, your family, your community, and your city. Demand it. Do not render yourself powerless. Do not operate beneath your privilege. Recognize that all politics are local, and the greatest changes are made at the local level, and local level politics are made by the voices of the people. Right. So stand up, be strong. Don't get discouraged. Don't get caught up into the negative foolishness that's being perpetuated uh, by the current folks in leadership. Be mindful of the fact that the reason that many of us as African-American people have a better life and are living in better circumstances and situations is because we demanded that our voice was heard and we and we turned our cries and our sorrow and our anger into legislative and policy change. Protest without policy is pure performance. Protest without policy is pure performance. So don't just get mad and scream about it. Definitely do that because there's never been change without protest. There is no power. There is no exchange of power without protest. So by all means, protest and demonstrate, but make sure the end game, the result of that, it's legislative and policy change that positively impacts the institution and systems that govern our lives. Stay strong, all power to the people. All right. All right. Well, thank you for sitting with me because, you know, and at the end of the day, no matter what we, you know, believe or what we, you know, we, we not, not, might not always see eye to eye or, you know, we might believe one thing or the other. Um, I think it's really important to be able to sit down and have civil conversations, you know, with, with everybody. And I, this is why I started this to be able to really get an, a deep introspective, you know, um, perspective on you know, just issues that are out there and to hear voices, to hear perspectives and to to make sure that, you know, we're we're all having these conversations and, you know, uh, just discussing things and, you know, having that kind of like workshop, let's talk it out kind of perspective. So this is why I started this, this not only this podcast, but, you know, this is a part of the work that I do, you know, as a civil servant um, to, to hear perspective. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to come on. And, and I respect um, you. And I respect you and appreciate you, Councilwoman Lyons. And also I respect and appreciate uh, the work and the contributions of Mayor Kimball. And I expect the appreciation, the great work of Rebecca Coleman, who you and I both know, and I know we're on different sides of this, but that's okay. But she's running for District 32A judge. And if the sister wins, she will be the first woman and the first African-American judge in Harper Woods history. 
So I want to make sure we make that known because this is a historical moment and we have an opportunity to do some great things. So I appreciate you, I respect you, I admire you, and I will continue to support you as long as you continue to support the people. Thank you, thank you, and I appreciate that. So um, without, without further ado, thank you for coming on the show and for, for your perspective. God bless you, sister. All right. Thank you.